G'day there guys. Um, as everyone is well aware, Australia and the rest of the world has gone through a pretty tough time now and what better way to pass the time than sit back and talk about some fishing. Uh, Dyer Australia come to me and asked if I'd be interested in doing a Q&A on Aussie bass and why not? sit down and we'll, uh, we'll go through some online comments and questions and I'll try and share some of my knowledge and experience I've had over the years. For people that don't know my background, I grew up and lived most of my life in the Hunter Valley, New South Wales, uh, fishing for Aussie bass because it was just a little bit too far uh, to go to the salt. I have spent a little bit of time chasing other species but my heart and my passion has always been with, uh, with bass. and. Around 15 years ago, I got into the tournament scene and that's really where my sort of knowledge and skills and techniques sort of uh, really developed because you, you get thrown in the deep end with tournaments and you learn a lot by your mistakes. So I, I've started out in the Hunter Valley. I used to walk the creeks, uh, end up getting a good kayak, small tinnies, then eventually worked my way up into a, uh, a fiberglass bass boat, which you see here. Um, so the guys have reached out on Instagram and Facebook and I've just printed out a series of questions here. If I don't get to all of them, feel free to uh, shoot me a direct message or I'll try and comment later on uh, if I've missed any. So I've just printed them out here and we're gonna start right from the top. Uh, do you feel retrieve ratios for reels are important when using different techniques to catch bass? Uh, yes, definitely. I use um, around three speeds um, in my bait casters when I'm chasing bass. So I generally have around a six speed and that's what I want to use for slow rolling. So I'm thinking like a spinner bait, a crank bait, a chatter bait. And that's mainly just to stop me from winding quick. I want to keep that thing nice and slow, nice steady pace, down nice and deep in the strike zone. Uh, next I have like a 7 speed and that's something that I'm going to use for most likely uh, top water. So like a walker, a buzz bait or a whopper plop or something like that. You need that little bit of extra speed, especially if I'm fishing a buzz bait. I need that buzz bait swimming as soon as it hits the water. So I'll be doing a uh, nice low cast up underneath the overhanging tree and as soon as I engage that reel I need that line back on the reel and I need that line tight so that buzz bait blade gets spinning. And you can't do that with a slow bait caster. And next would be an eight speed or above. And that's something I'm gonna use for fishing a skirted jig or maybe like a soft vibe or something like that. Something where I use the rod to give action to the lure and the reel is only used for one and the slack line up. And that mainly comes down to a fish picking the lure up um, when there is, when the line is slack, you need to be able to have that speed to get the line back on to be able to strike down on that fish. So next up we have, what is your biggest strength and weakness as a bass angler? Uh, <laughs> wow, we've all got plenty of weaknesses. Um, I'd say my biggest weakness is definitely, I like to throw weird stuff. I've burnt too many tournaments that I can think of, trying to be a really left field and throwing lures that aren't sort of renowned um, tournament winners, you know, like a, I throw a lot of weird stuff like a drop shot and a hair jig and always trying to come up with that sort of new technique and it certainly has cost me a lot of times. Uh, my strengths, um, I don't try and sort of align myself with one sort of style of fishing. I, certainly if it's it's shallow water, sort of warmer water, I do enjoy fishing that a lot more, but I would say I, I'm fairly versatile. It, it doesn't really matter if I have a spin or a bait cast or if I'm fishing finesse or deep. Um, I, I like to try and be fairly open-minded when it comes to fishing. So next up we have what three rods do you always have on the deck ready to go? Uh, this is a bit of a hard question because it can, can depend on the uh, area that I'm fishing. Generally, if I'm fishing a river or a creek, I fish slightly shorter rods, around seven foot. And if I'm fishing in a lake, generally I'm going for long cast, distance cast. I'm fishing 
seven twos, threes, you know, sixes all the way up. But if it come down to three rods, um, probably the 611 medium TD0 all round, I could use it as a jig rod, a reaction bait uh, rod. It's, it's short enough that I can pitch and skip cast with it in a river, but still long enough that I can comfortably fish an impoundment. Two other rods would probably be spin rods, I'd say the uh, seven uh, foot light uh, TD Hyper, the new one. It's just a great all round rod. It's, it's good for sort of quarter ounce plastics. Um, it's good for jerk bait. It's good for top water. It's just a good, um, good blank. I just love it. And probably the last one, I'd probably have to go with a, probably the seven foot ultralight TD Hyper, I reckon it would, um, it would allow me to fish like those really light lures, like a, a 1 16th plastic and a grub or something like that. So yeah, I'm pretty confident. Yeah, that I'd be happy with those three, I reckon. Um, when are you taking over the brim scene? Not anytime soon. <laughs> um, I have fished a couple of brim tournaments this year and that's just more or less coming out of, I've been fishing for bass for so long, I'm just looking for something to, a bit more of a variety I suppose um, when you have fish for the same fish for a long time at the same venue a lot it's, sometimes it can get a little stale I suppose especially if you if you're catching them on the same technique all the time so the brim scene has been exciting for me it's new it's something I haven't really experienced and obviously I always want to be a better angler so uh, fishing alongside uh, different anglers and new techniques that I haven't done before allows me to adapt and maybe bring something back to the bass scene as well but you haven't got anything to worry about the brim blokes because I am probably never ever going to win one of them. <laughs> um, what are you looking forward to once all this is over? Um, just to go fishing again, I suppose. I, I'm at this time when I'm filming this, fishing hasn't been banned, but I, I feel like I'm taking a fairly practical approach to this, and I've decided not to fish. Like it's just a and an unnecessary risk uh, to bring upon myself, my work, my family, uh, and just the whole uh, whole scenario. Um, so just to get out fishing again, um, you know, I think the quicker we can get on top of this the uh, the quicker we can get our lives back to normal and just to be able to catch up with mates again and to be able to shake people's hands and give them a hug again that feels really weird it's awkward it's just something we're so used to uh, so yeah it's hopefully this only takes a month or two or well, fingers crossed what are your go-to techniques for fishing uh, chatterbait in different situations such as structure points weed beds and the deeper winter school bite. Well the way I think about a chatterbait is I like to break my um, lures down into different categories. I'm still targeting the same fish but for me a chatterbait, um, another name for it is like a weedless uh, crankbait because of that single hook or the, the hook and the stinger pointing upwards um, it's really good to bring over the top of weeds beds or even sink down into them and rip them out because it's sort of semi weedless. So any sort of weed, I'm gonna be fishing a chatterbait for sure. Uh, the other thing that I love about it, it's ability to skip cast, especially when I'm fishing rivers. I love fishing a chatterbait in a river. Um, you, you rig up like a three eighth or a quarter ounce with a nice, um, you know, fairly thick, like three inch paddle tail and that thing skips like a rock. It's awesome. It's, you're able to put it right up in the back of lay downs uh, under overhanging branches, just places you, you can't get other lures and that's one of the reasons I love it there. And he, he mentions about a deep winter school bite. I haven't really done much winter fishing um, with a chatterbait. I know the guys up in Queensland throw them a fair bit up there in the schools and they certainly work. Um, but deep fishing is another thing that the, uh, the chatterbait shines in because it, it can sink. So you can fish it in a foot of water over weed bed or you can cast it out into the middle and let it sink all the way to the bottom. So that is one of the one ways that it's very versatile like that. Um, yeah, don't try and pigeonhole exactly where a, uh, a chatterbait will work. Um, there are 
are really no rules to fishing. It's more of a guideline, I suppose, an experience that I'm just trying to share with you guys. See how you've already won a grand final and now an Aussie Bass Open. What is your new goal in fishing? Um, new goal? I, I wouldn't call it new, it's one I've always had for a long time. I just haven't really chased it for a long time. It, Angler of the year is one, one thing I've always wanted to get, but unfortunately for me, I've never really had the opportunity not recently to, to chase it because I've generally with I work weekends and family and other commitments I'm unable to fish um, a full year not for a long time anyway now I did come second or oh, a long time ago now 10 years ago now and that, that's around the last time that I really chased angler of the year and that was as close as I've ever come but hopefully one day I get another shot at it so that would be cool what is your quickest or most effective way technique for finding bass in a new fishing venue location uh, quickest most effective way I'm gonna say uh, probably technology here so uh, anytime I'm going to a new venue the first thing that I'm going to do is look at it on Google Earth I'm going to try and find any fishing maps that I can that I can look at, so that's any that's going to show me depths and contours and things like that, so I can see like um, old riverbeds in lakes and I can see channel swings and things like that. And obviously, Google Maps is really good for seeing um, yeah, drop offs in shallow water and weed beds. Um, I'm going to look up fishing reports or old tournaments that have been won at the venue before and my sounders, I suppose. Uh, if I can see fish on the sounders and I know I'm around them I'm pretty confident that I can sort of um, you know stick in that area so yeah I'd, I'd have to say technologies the way it's evolved and the way the new transducers that are coming out now uh, yeah it's it's making it really easy to to find fish not always catch them but uh, so next up we have favorite technique and how do you do it effectively um, Favourite technique, I wouldn't say I've got a favourite technique, I'd just say more the style of fishing that I like to do. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I like to call myself fairly versatile, but if I had a choice, there would be a bait caster in my hand, I'd be fishing shallow cover that, I'm cast, that I can see that I'm casting at, and so generally anything sort of 12, 10 foot or shallower. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a reaction or a jig or something like that or a top water even. Um, yeah, and it, to do it effectively, I'd say the right tools for the job. So if I'm fishing shallow water cover, you know, I'm, I'm running a sounder and I'm, I've, I've got new ways of seeing around in front of me with the, uh, with the new 360. Um, I run Costa sunglasses. They allow me to see well into the, into the water and the right tools for the job. So. We're going to talk about um, you know the right rod and line and reel set up for the lure that you're, uh, you're fishing. Uh, biggest Aussie bass, where and when and how was it caught? Okay, this is back. I remember this fish very well. Obviously, you, you, you remember all your PBs, I suppose, or you, the very biggest one. Um, it was 2006 or seven. I can't remember the year, but it was September and it was in a tournament. It was at Lake Sinclair and the lake had just risen uh, around the end of winter and there was a massive algae bloom in the lake and there was like a, a layer of um, like this brown scum and it was actually, it was about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning and the sun was out, it was super bright, bluebird skies, but it came on a top water and that algae bloom actually helped us um, that day or that whole weekend actually because we were fishing top water and it was creating shade up against the um, up against the banks that we're fishing even though there's no overhangs no overhanging um, trees or anything like that at uh, Lake Sinclair yeah and he ate a, a top water popper actually and I knew it was a big fish straight away because he didn't explode on it he just come up and swirled on it and, and yeah swam out and literally just netted him I was just like Whoop big fish and it went 54 to the fork and it was 2.62 kilos it was 
biggest bass I've ever caught. It was actually funny because it was in a tournament and the other fish that I caught was a 31 centimeter. <laughs> so when I held it up for the photo, I had this giant one and this tiny little baby one. And it, it, the little one looks like it's undersized. It's that small compared to this other giant. What do you use with shut down bass? Um, that's gonna have to be a curl tail grub. I've got the dogs in the background going maniac at the moment. Um, but it's a curl tail grub. It's, it's just an all round pro producer, whether it's sort of two inch, two and a half, three inch, whatever, depending on the, the, the size of the bait and the area that I'm fishing. And you know, I can fish it really light and slow, or I can fish it on a heavy head, like if they're hard on the bottom. Um, you know, like up in fishing in Queensland empowerment. So yeah, yeah, I'd have to say the curl tail, definitely. If you could only fish two destinations for the rest of your life, one for quantity, one for quality, where and what on? Um, I would have to say quantity would be Cania, midweek when no one's there. Uh, I fished a lot of tournaments there and they certainly feel the pressure there because it's a, such a small lake, but if you can get that lake when no one is on it, it's magical. You honestly get sick of catching fish there. Um, I think I've had a couple of sessions there where I've found a school and I've thrown every lure in my boat and, and caught them. And they, they get some big fish in there as well. So Cania, and if you're going for quality, uh, You'd have to say Lake Somerset. I'm not a big fan of the lake. It's not really my favorite lake to fish, but hands down, I've caught more big bass there than any other lake. I've caught that many over 45 and 48s into the 50s and that, um, but yet my biggest bass is still from Lake Sinclair, which I'm still proud of actually. I've caught plenty in that sort of low twos, um, but I kind of don't want to break that big bass um, with just a Somerset you know, just a, a 50 in winter weight that weighs three kilos. I, I like my big bass as a, a 2.6 on top at, um, at Sinclair. What is your one go-to jig trailer color? Uh, black, hands down black. Uh, if you've ever looked at a crawfish in clear water, uh, they're black. Uh, every bait fish or fish adapts to their surroundings. So in clear water, they generally go dark, so black and in dirty water, black stands out. It really contrasts against it. So it doesn't matter what water clarity I'm fishing, 90% of the time, I'm fishing a black jig and a black trailer. But what do I look for when I'm approaching a spot to fish? Um, what do I look for? Probably just visible cover. What I'm, as I mentioned earlier, about finding locations using technology. If I'm approaching this area now, now I'm using my eyes, I'm sort of looking maybe at the contour of the bank, what I can see, a, a gully, what visible structure there might be around. Um, yeah, what might, what might concentrate those fish and help me sort of come up with a pattern where they might be positioned. So yeah, I'd, I'd say what I can see above the water. Are cheap lures better than expensive? Are cheap lures better than expensive? Ooh, well, I wouldn't say the price always has uh, determines whether a good lure or not. I'd say more the design. Generally, a more expensive lure has more design points. So bass fish and lures are generally fairly small, Aussie bass fish and lures, they're fairly small. And some of them, like especially if we're talking like, uh, like a hard body, a jerk bait, a crank bait, things like that, some of them are really hard to cast. So if you've got one that's got a, a weight transfer in it, um, you know, all the terminals come you know, really good, like a split rings and um, trebles and things like that. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna lose fish and that weight transfer is gonna allow you gonna, to cast further and to be able to cover more water. So yes, in a nutshell, I suppose, the, generally the slightly more expensive lures, um, they're, they're easier to fish with and if you're fishing a tournament or the fishing's tough and you're only getting a couple of bites and that couple of bites can turn into half a dozen bites because you can cast that a little bit further or 
you know, you can swim a diver down deeper because of that casting distance, yes. So it does play, play uh, into your hands a little bit that way. What do you generally use in the cooler seasons? So, it doesn't really matter if I'm fishing a, a river, even uh, Queensland as well. You, you can't go past a plastic, uh, whether it's a, a paddle tail or a curl tail plastic. Um, they're such a versatile lure. Generally, a fish, there's metabolism. I wouldn't say it's slowed down, but they're targeting slightly smaller baits. So generally, plastic aligns a little bit better in the cooler months, especially here in New South Wales and in the rivers as well. Uh, so yeah, I'd say a soft plastic. What's your favourite skirt of jig rod? This is David on Instagram. That would be the 7-2 uh, TD0. It was designed as sort of a, as being a little bit of a multi-purpose one, but uh, when I spoke to some of the guys in the design um, side of things from Daiwa, they've certainly, a skirted jig was, uh, was certainly thought about when this uh, rod was designed, and I just love it, everything about it. It's, it's perfect for fishing a jig, especially in impoundments. It's not too long that I'm able to pitch with it, but it's still long enough that I can cover a lot of water and I can bomb out some big cast onto like a point or something like that or, or a tree that might be sort of out of a, a shorter rod's distance. What are you looking for in rods for jigs, jerk baits, plastic surface, uh, length, stiffness, etc.? That's a pretty big question, I suppose, but uh, what you should think about when you're selecting a rod uh, is what lure you want to throw with it. So we're, we're all targeting the same fish um, when we're talking bass or even brim and things like that. Like generally they're like the same size, you know, brim, flathead, whatever else. They're, they're all around a fish around sort of, you know, 40 centimetres we'll say. So they all fight fairly similar, the same sort of weight. So when selecting a rod, it should be about the lure that you want to use. So with like a, a jig, a chatterbait, um, you know, or a plastic, I'm generally going for an extra fast taper. So we've got, it's got a fairly soft tip, but a strong backbone. And that, that just comes down to the single hook. I want to be able to drive that hook home and I want to have good penetration. So that, so that good uh, extra fast taper is perfect for that. If I want to fish something with trebles, generally I'm going for something with a regular taper. So, and that just comes down to maybe the action that I want as well. Um, when I'm fishing a crankbait or something like that, I don't want too stiff of an action because a crankbait really comes down to being able to deflect off hard cover, so like rock and timber and that. So you don't want a really stiff rod to sort of, um, you want that softer rod to be able to absorb that and that bounce and it looks a lot more natural. And when they eat a crankbait too, sometimes they don't have it in their mouth, they'll have the trebles up the side of their face and whatnot, so you want that slightly softer action to absorb that fight uh, so you don't pull as many hooks. And as far as lengths go, generally, I'm six foot tall, I stick to seven foot. I don't really fish rods shorter than that. It just doesn't suit my style. I cast two-handed, so I like uh, the longer seven foot rods. There's plenty of rods out there that are shorter and they sort of, certainly suit guys, um, but for me, I'm a, I, I like the seven foot range. Spinning or bait caster? <laughs> bait caster. <laughs> I spoke about before being versatile, but, and pretty well, it's gonna have to be a bait caster. I just feel comfortable throwing that. It's, if it's a nice heavy lure, um, I'm a lot more accurate, uh, I can pitch, um, I'm not that great with a spin rod, I'll admit it. I've spent all my years casting at impoundments where pretty much I just lob over my shoulder. Um, fishing for brim recently, oh, I'm not very accurate at all because I haven't had to be, you know, I'm not truly really trying to land on a dime, I'm sort of just landing in an area more than anything, so yeah, definitely the bait caster. Best all round bass lures for cold conditions, versus hot conditions. Uh, all rounder, so we'll just keep this fairly brief. Cold conditions, so I'm thinking winter. Uh, as I mentioned before, with shut down bass, it's probably just gonna be a plastic. So I'd probably go a curl tail. Uh, again, 
It's a really versatile lure. It's, you can wind it as slow as you want, you can burn it, uh, you can fish it really shallow. You know, for, for fish that might be up high, you can slow roll it through suspended fish, uh, you know, or you can fish it on the bottom. And versus hot conditions, so I'm guessing we'll, we'll assume summer, so best all round lure for summer. It's, it's, it's probably the jig, I'd have to say. Um, you know, you, you, you can catch them on top water really well, um, but as an all rounder, a jig just works and you can catch them all day on a jig. You know, you might start out shallow throwing at trees and then by the end of the day, if it's really hot, you might end up dragging them in 40 foot and still catching them, so. How do you work your skirted jigs? Uh, slow, very slow. Uh, I'm not a big fan, like sometimes I'll drag a, a football jig, like a really heavy football jig, like a five eighths, three quarter, uh, an ounce. Um, you know, just like a, a side sweeping action and that's more about covering, uh, you know, more flats and sort of slow undulating drop-offs and things like that. But when I'm casting specifically to cover, so it might be a lay down, um, minimal movement. I suggest everyone, um, short piece of line, if you've got a swimming pool or even just grab one of the missus um, salad bowls or something like that, fill it up with water, put a trailer on it and throw your jig in. You watch that thing, that skirt just explodes when it sits there on the bottom and the little craw trailer stands up. You really don't need to do much with them at all. I'm just literally just tapping the slack as I work it and I'm sort of relying on an accurate cast in amongst the structure for that fish to have seen it. So he, he knows it's in this area um, I've chosen a, a weight jig that it's not plummeting to the bottom, that it just, it's falling at a nice sort of uh, descent, and he's seen it. And literally all I need to do is just tap it, and he should be coming down on it and looking at it. And I'm just tapping it, and I feel that that jig should draw him in on the drop, and hopefully just, just tapping it will get him to eat it. If there's nothing really there, there's no, for me, fishing a jig, there's no real point me fishing it out two, three, four metres away from the structure. If they don't eat it when it's right on the structure, I wind back in, I might fish the back side of it. I might do multiple casts around it, but I barely move my jig when I do it. So I hope that helps in that, that regard. Do you pay attention to the lunar phase when chasing bass? As most fishermen, as they evolve, they find that obviously the, the weather is the main driving factor behind uh, how the fish react and set up. You know, as it gets warmer and cooler, these are the main things that, um, that make the fish change or transition into one thing or another. And certainly the moon phase has an effect on Aussie bass, especially in Palmet ones. You wouldn't think so, but it does. Um, probably the biggest thing I've noticed with the moon phase is uh, a full moon is probably your biggest factor. Uh, if I feel a lot, a lot of the time the fish must eat during the night and because you, you'll fish in morning and typically that's your, your prime time um, to catch a lot of fish as that sun's coming up and in a full moon it's very short that window but then all of a sudden you get like a, a weird bite period around sort of 10, 11, 12 o'clock sort of thing, a real middle of the day abnormal bite period and that's generally around a full moon so yeah it doesn't affect what I'm throwing or what I'm doing I just I always have it in the back of my mind that there's generally going to be another peak bite period coming up with it around that sort of lunar phase. Have you found a water temp that needs to be reached before our bass start to take top water lures uh, in your local hunter region empowerments? Um, Yes, I, there's no hard and fast rules with top water. I've caught them all year round. Um, but generally, I, I like to aim for around that 17 degrees. So whether that's coming into winter or coming out of winter into spring. So when that water, surface water temp hits around 17 degrees, um, generally you start catching more numbers of bass on top. And that can always depend on rain and things like that, that's generally the biggest influencer uh, is rain on whether they want to eat top water or not. So yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go with 17 degrees or 18, around that.
<laughs> uh, last, last but not least, bloody rusty barbecue. On average, how many zip ties do you have to cut off a boat at an event before you can fish? Many, generally many. Uh, depends on how long I uh, leave my boat for. <laughs> anyway, uh, I hope you guys got a little bit of an insight into some of the experiences and a bit of a guide, I suppose, and might help you out in targeting an Aussie bass in the near future. Uh, I want everyone to stay strong over this and stay safe. Uh, hopefully it's only a fairly short time, fingers crossed, and we're all back out on the water, and I'll see you there soon, hopefully.